Great work from Jules, and we um, continue uh, uh, seven, eight. Continue the uh, um, clinical phenotypic uh, area with Heidi talking about matchmaker exchange. Uh, we've got four more to go. I slightly regret not sending you all out for coffees at some point. Um, but, but stay with us, write down your questions. And I am not going to talk about matchmaker exchange, although <laughs> I am going to talk about knowledge standards that support projects like matchmaker exchange. And I did actually just want to start off with why is it important that we share knowledge and standardize how we represent it? Um, this is a story I shared uh, with a reporter a few years ago. Um, basically, my lab had detected a variant in the PTPN11 gene in a fetus with increased nuchal translucency seen on ultrasound. That variant had been reported and observed in an Ashkenazi Jewish patient with Noonan syndrome uh, from a very well-respected lab in this field. Um, although they didn't, at the time, this was maybe reported 10 years ago, didn't have a lot of population data. I actually tried to get access to a private data set of Ashkenazi Jewish individuals to determine the allele frequency and was denied access to that data. Um, we ended up reporting the variant as likely pathogenic based on the body of evidence that was available, and that couple chose to terminate their pregnancy. Um, later, I found out that variant had a high frequency in the Ashkenazi Jewish population from a data set uh, that was in the hands of the researchers at the time that the couple made this decision, and that variant was and would have been known to be benign. So that was an example of a bad outcome. It still haunts me to this day. Um, but six years later, we, we're, we're doing better. <laughs> we have resources like ClinGen and ClinVar and allele frequency databases like XAC and Nomad from Danny MacArthur's team at the Broad Institute. And that's really making a difference. And in fact, a different story just this past, um, about a year ago actually, another woman <laughs> reached out to me by email having had prenatal genetic testing also prompted by an increased nuchal translucency that revealed a variant of uncertain significance on her report and she was concerned about her pregnancy. Uh, and she reached out based on my ClinVar entry, because now I'm sharing all of the interpretations from my clinical lab. And you can see uh, my lab and GeneDx had both uh, interpreted this variant as uncertain. Um, but she didn't stop there. She wanted to find out more information. And so I um, spent some time digging up clinical records. I reached out to GeneDx asked for their records, and ultimately were able to combine enough data to reclassify the variant as likely benign. She continued her pregnancy and gave birth to a healthy child that fall. This was a much better outcome uh, than the first story. Um, but that did take a sucker like me who cared, um, digging up a paper requisition form from our clinical lab, you know, records that are on uh, scanned and on uh, file in Iron Mountain, uh, emailing a friend at GeneDx to ask a favor to get their case level data. She had to look up and contact clinicians and get that information and email it back to me. And then I had to put all that data together and reclassify the variant. It was not a quick process, so that family was waiting uh, while pregnant for this information. So I think we can do this better. We need better resources to, in real time, get access to this information so that it doesn't take you know, somebody willing to do extensive time and favors for others. Um, we're not even knowing who to turn to to ask. So a couple of different kinds of resources to sort support this kind of activity are gene level databases. The, this is a figure showing the number of genes in cardiomyopathy tests from 14 labs in the US, completely different. Why? Because we have had no good standards for what level of evidence is necessary to implicate a gene in disease, a very basic question. Recently, we've gathered a number of organizations that are working on gene level resources or have them out in the community um, through this effort called the Gene Curation Consortium, or GenCC. And so we've been starting to compare approaches. Um, this is just some data from ClinGen's expert panels in classifying variants. And what you can see in, in our system of scoring genes definitive down to refuted or disputed, that in each of these disease areas, you can see a pretty substantial number of genes in pink or red that indicates they have not enough evidence to implicate them in disease. These are all from reported publications of gene disease relationships. Um, another effort that was just um, uh, reported in the last week from Naz Rahman's group 
uh, in the UK going through 19,000 genes and trying to rapidly um, classify their highest level of implication. Um, and the results shown here categorizing them into four different uh, levels. We've now started comparing ClinGen to the TGMI data set. We are definitely seeing differences, and so now it's time to figure out how are we different, why are we different. Um, also, in the workshop yesterday, Ellen McDonough and Zornitza Stark presented data comparing Australian genomics panels with Genomics England panels. And as some of you may know, Genomics England has a public panel app out there, look, and they're looking at um, the evidence for genes implicated in disease and whether they should be in panels. So we're all starting to work together now. However, we all have different systems. This is the terminology being used across the six different groups. You can see some are terms, some are color schemes. In fact, you can see red is implicated in disease in one system and not implicated in disease in the other system. So we clearly have some challenges here. Um, we are now working on a Delphi survey process to come to consensus across the community and even how we term the, the relationships between genes and disease, um, as well as the actual evidence level required to get there. And then that'll allow us to actually work collaboratively and share this. Now that's based on having a common data model that underlies the evidence and the um, classification schemes we use for genes that is critically important for our genomic knowledge standards work group. And this is just a, a diagram of the data model being created by this group um, that will also underlie an API that will allow us to share this data in real time across our groups. If we switch to variant knowledge resources, this is just data from the ClinVar database where there's been over 700,000 variant interpretations submitted. Now, we still have a lot more work. There are more than 700,000 variants in the world. There are millions, so we need more data. In fact, 82% of the submissions represent the only submission on that variant. Some of them, we have multiple submissions on the same variant, and that has led to the identification of medically significant differences in interpretation between variants. But if you look and dive a little deeper into some of these differences, it sometimes is based on what, how we're interpreting what we're interpreting. For example, this mutation may be pathogenic for melanoma, but uncertain for Wardenberg syndrome. That's not actually a conflict. It's just being interpreted for two different conditions. Here, this gene is associated with two different diseases, one dominant and one recessive. That's the basis for some of the difference. Here, uh, different interpretations based on a germline context or a somatic context. Here, it might be important to know that this interpretation was made by an expert panel versus a single lab. Or here, this interpretation was made in 2018 versus here in 2004. Maybe uh, this data may be better based on population data. So these, this really underlies the fact that in in order to annotate uh, variants, we need models that un, uh, define the clinical significance, the disease, the inheritance, the context, as well as the source and date, all of that information if we're actually going to be able to compare and use this information effectively. We also have very many ways to name a variant. This is just about 14 on one screenshot from ClinVar. Um, and how do we know that when we say GLU-318 lice, it's the same variant as GLU-419 lice? because different transcripts. So we need ways to define and represent variants unambiguously. And so this, uh, the no Genomic Knowledge Standards work group, which is uh, led by Bob Freemuth and Andy Yates, you heard from Andy earlier on a different project. But the goal here is really to develop a framework of standard-based components that lower barriers for exchanging genomic information so that we can use it in clinical care scenarios like I just said. And the two major projects they're working on are variant representation as well as variant annotation. So just uh, two slides and then I'll be finished. Uh, the goal is really to precisely define a semantic model to describe variants, um, as well as the implementing schemas based on mod modeled components. Um, there's a GitHub um, location for some of the work that they've been doing to date, but really working on defining the location, the alleles, the haplotypes, the genotypes, all this information so we can accurately represent variants in individuals and be sure that we're communicating and building evidence on the same variants that we identify. Uh, it seems like a simple task, but it's actually a lot more complex than you would think. Um, and then once we can unambiguously define the variant, we need to effectively annotate it. 
what's its clinical significance and all the information I just told you about. So we, they're building models to support the annotations of diverse types of statements about variants, as well as the evidence and the provenance of where that information came from and showing you that you don't just trust me that I say something is pathogenic, but I can back that up with the evidence that proves that. Um, the goal and deliverables for this group is really to get a draft data model out by January 2019 with a public release um, in the following fall. These are some of the driver projects that are working with the genomic knowledge standards. Um, and this is uh, a, a data model or framework to think about the connectivity of information that we can structure and enable unambiguous annotation of variants for use in many different aspects. Um, and I'll just stop there and, and say that you know the genomic knowledge standards represents a number of the driver projects that are working really at this interface of bringing the evidence base from a lot of our other driver projects all the way to implementation in national initiatives. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.